song, you know, you move mountains. You know, when, when we read the scriptures, we read these stories of a Jesus who moves mountains, a God who parts the seas, a God who gives life to the dead, a God who heals the cripple, a God who gives sight to the blind. And I think that's why it's so important for us to gather as a church and sing these songs. These songs are not for us, they're not for you. They, they might be on your Spotify playlist and you might be rocking to them in the car while you're driving around, but these songs aren't for you. These songs we sing as adoration to a God who is worthy of our praise. And we sing these songs as a reminder that the same God of Scripture is the same God of today. That the same God of Scripture who was able to do miraculous things can still do miraculous things for you today. You see, we think we come to church for us, but, but we're really here for God. And I want to thank you for coming and being a part of who Bolingbroke Church is because it is a part of every one of you. So I want to invite you to bow your heads with me as we get ready to receive the word. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much, so, so much. Because even though we're here to worship you, Lord, God, you fill us with your presence. God, even though we think we're here to give our tithes and our offerings, God, you still give so much in return. And so, God, we receive your blessings with open arms, but God, we are thankful that you are gracious towards us. So we ask now, as we get ready to open up the word, that you would speak through the preacher, but that you would more importantly make our hearts receptive to hear your word. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. So I'm excited today for a couple of different reasons. I'm always excited on Sabbath because I get to spend the day with my family. It's a really long day as a pastor in the church here. Uh, we get here sometimes pretty early in the morning, but it doesn't seem like we get home until late in the evening on a Saturday. But I love Sabbath because I get to spend it with my family. I don't always get to spend the whole day with my family. I get to see you all. I get to sing together. We get to hear the word together. But I'm excited, not just because of that, but I'm excited because we're starting our brand new sermon series, As It Is in Heaven. And for those of you who have been a part of the church, you instantly know that that's part of the Lord's Prayer. Like even if you haven't come to church, people know the Lord's Prayer. You know, as a hospital chaplain, when I help out every once in a while, usually they only call us in as on-call chaplains when somebody is either on death's doorstep or once the patient has passed. And whether a family is religious or not, one of the things they always ask is, will you lead us in the Lord's Prayer? Whether they're Christian or Catholic or nominally Christian, they always ask, can we do the Lord's Prayer? And you know, so much of the time, and I'll do it gladly, because as you know, we're there to serve the family, especially in those very difficult and trying times. But it's interesting because the Lord's Prayer has been so associated with death. You go to a funeral, oftentimes you'll have someone in the family read the Lord's Prayer. But in truth, when we look at the Lord's Prayer, Jesus is teaching his disciples how to pray. And it's not a formula for how to get God to do what you want God to do. Because I know that we all wish we had that formula. I know that there are some of you who have formulas for your prayers, hoping that God will listen. But Jesus says, no, listen, I'm gonna teach you how to pray. And then he goes into the Lord's Prayer, and, and, and the verse that matters for us here over the next month and a half is when Jesus says, your kingdom come, speaking to God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is where? In heaven. Jesus says, pray that God's will will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. Now, I don't know if you've ever stopped to really think about what that means. I don't know if you've ever really stopped to ask, well, what does that mean? Because for most of us growing up in the church, all we cared about is making sure that we were saved so that we can go to heaven. That when Jesus returns, we can escape this earth and go to heaven. And yet what we find here is that Jesus is actually saying, no, you as a follower of Jesus. Now listen, by the way, this is just for those of you who are followers of Jesus. Like if you haven't given your heart to Jesus, I mean, you can still be a part of this prayer, but this is, this is a requirement for those of you who have given your life to Jesus. 
when you pray that God's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven, Jesus is inviting you to have a new mindset about what it means to live your life of faith here on earth. Jesus isn't just worried about escaping you into a future reality, but Jesus is interested in teaching you how to live today. Your faith is about how you can live today in a way that is faithful to what God desires. So when Jesus teaches you to pray that God's will would be done on earth, what Jesus is actually saying is, if God's will is to be done on earth, God chooses a people or a person like you to live out the ways of Jesus in a way that, reflect, that affect the lives of those closest to you. Jesus has a plan and a work for you to do, and Jesus telling you that his will would be done on earth is that he is asking you to be a part of what God is doing in this world. It's not just about getting that promotion. It's not just about getting that next step or getting that job that you want. It's not just about your investments. It's not just about the material possessions you can buy, but to live a life of faith. Again, this is just for those of you who have given your life to Jesus. Is are you willing to submit to the plan that God has for your life? As it is in heaven, in your home, as it is in heaven, in Bolingbrook, as it is in heaven, in Chicagoland, as it is in heaven. In Forest Lake, as it is in heaven. In Chicago, God is looking for a people like you who are willing to be his aroma, his ambassador everywhere that you go. So when Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven, Jesus isn't just talking about a future reality where he will come and take us all to heaven, but when Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven, he is talking about a way of living that you can experience something deeper in this world than just what your eyes can see. For Jesus, the kingdom of heaven is something that happens here and now. So for the ancient Bible writers, they viewed history as an arrow that goes from the beginning of time until what we consider the end of time, and that God has a trajectory like an arrow, and the things that happen all happen for a reason. That even the difficult, dark moments in your life, if you allow them to, you can find purpose in the pain of your life. And God will not waste the pain in your life because God has a purpose for you, for you to be his aroma, for you to be his ambassador in your home as it is in heaven, at your job, at the hospital, as it is in heaven, at your job, at the school, as it is in heaven, at your job, at city hall, as it is in heaven. God wants you to be a representative of the kingdom of heaven everywhere that you go. And so when we talk about the kingdom of heaven, I hope you're saying like, but pastor, my life is hard. You don't know what I've gone through. For you to talk about heaven, I just lost my husband. I just had a conversation with someone this morning in my office in between services that lost their husband and, it was un and they were not expecting it. God, Pastor, you don't know what I'm going through. And here's the reality is that we will face inordinate amount of, of struggle in our life one day, God will redeem it. But in the now and in the here, God is asking you to be a part of what he's doing. So Luke chapter 11, verse 20, Jesus was being accused by the religious people. Isn't it funny that it was always the religious people who were accusing Jesus? So ironic. <laughs> Which makes me think, like, if Jesus was here today, would we, would we be on Jesus' side or would we be the religious people attacking him? Because Jesus came in and disrupted everything. Jesus came in and challenged the way religious people were living their life. I mean, do you remember, do you remember the, the miracle? The very first miracle in John, it tells us that Jesus was at a wedding. And what does Jesus do at a wedding? He turns water into, that was his first miracle. <laughs> right? Jesus was about like being present to the people in his life that needed help. So that was his very first miracle. Now, what you might not remember is that Jesus tells the attendants of the wedding to take the ceremonial jars. Do you guys remember that? 
He says, take the ceremonial jars and fill them with water. And then Jesus turns that water into wine. Now, these ceremonial jars were used by religious people to wash their hands and wash their feet to be ready to, 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 um, to enter into the temple. Jesus took what was sacred and for many of the religious people made them profane. So I wonder if Jesus was here and disrupted the way we do things, would we follow him? Would you follow him? Do you follow Jesus when he disrupts your will in your way? Or would we attack him? So the religious people were attacking Jesus and they would even say that Jesus casts out demons because he and the devil were family. These religious people who knew the Bible front and back were accusing Jesus of being Satan himself. And in Luke eleven twenty, 20, Jesus says, Jesus cast out demons and says, if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. For Jesus, the kingdom of God is equaled to the presence of Jesus which means that you can enter into the kingdom of God today in the here and the now. And it's not heaven, but it's a kingdom of God that is here and real anytime that you seek the presence of Jesus, amen? Anytime you seek the presence of Jesus through prayer, through the word, through your thoughts, through your mindset, through just thinking about Jesus, you are entering into the kingdom of heaven. And what's even better how many of you who grew up in the church, what, what, what is the name given to Jesus by the angel? When angel comes to Mary and Mary says, you are going to have the son of God and his name shall be Emmanuel, which means God with us, which means that if God is with you, he is not apart from you. And if God is with you, you have access to the kingdom of heaven everywhere that you are. Jesus says, if I cast out demons, if I do miracles by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Ah, oh, family, I don't know about you, but I've lived through some things in my life that felt more like hell than heaven. I have gone through things in my life that have been so painful that I never thought I would experience. But you know what I found? That in the moments of my greatest struggle, in the moments when I sought the presence of Jesus, I had the most peace in my life. In the moments when I should not have had peace in my life, when I sought the presence of Jesus, God allowed me to feel the peace that surpasses all understanding. So to seek the presence of Jesus is for you to begin to enter into the kingdom of God. Now, what that tells us is that while we wait for the full picture of heaven to come one day, we can begin to live as though it is real for us today. There is a way that you can live a certain kind of reality in your life that may not actually be true, but you're still living it. If you have, let, let me give you an example. Tomorrow, your pastor is running the Chicago Marathon. Not that, yeah, go ahead, you can clap. Thank you, Tyler. Not 13.1 miles, not the 5K, 26.2 miles of joy and peace and love and pain. Okay, pastor, why are you telling us this? You're just flexing. No, because someone this morning told me, I didn't know you were built that way. I'm like, I mean. <laughs> it was a friend, but that was funny. I'm like, Oof. I'm gonna be tomorrow. But here's what's happening. To, to run a marathon, there's a level of training that has to go into it, amen? So there were days when I would train my body by going to the gym and I do leg exercises and core exercises. And so I did that. There's other parts of training, how you eat. That, you know, I got like a C minus on how I ate for the last few months, but that's all right. And then there's running, obviously, because if you're gonna run a marathon, you gotta run. And so I would go out there. Um, I would try to train in extreme weather. So, you know, when we were on vacation, whether it was in South Carolina out by the beach where it was disgustingly hot and humid, or when we were in, and, and I'm not showing off, this was given to us as a gift by my brother. When we went to Cancun <laughs> a few weeks back, it was 90, 95 degrees with 100% humidity. It was hot. And so your pastor would go out in the middle of the day at the hottest point, and I would put in six to seven miles because I was trying to train my body for extremes. 
I have been living the marathon for the last four to five months of my life. I haven't run it yet, but I was living it. The kingdom of heaven is just like that as well. The way that you live your life of faith, your prayer life, your, your coming to scriptures, your church life, how you live your life, you can live as though you are in heaven because the Bible calls you a citizen of heaven. Did you know that? Before you're a citizen of any country that you're from, you are a citizen of heaven, which means that you can begin to live the heavenly life here and now until the day that heaven actually comes to earth. You can, that, that is the life of faith. If Jesus was only worried about getting you out of this earth to go to heaven, like we would all be there like 2,000 years ago, right? If that's all Jesus and God cared about was getting you out of this earth to go to, to heaven, we would all be gone. And yet some of you have lived your entire life. Some of you will live out your whole life on this earth and not see heaven until you wake up the next time. So it makes us think, well, Jesus... Is there something you want us to do while we're here on this earth? Is there something you want us to do here on earth as it is in heaven? And so I wanna, I wanna spend a few minutes, um, I'm gonna spend the rest of my time on this next passage. So we're gonna go to um, John chapter 17. And I wanna give you a glimpse about what it looks like to live and experience the the the. the the glimpse of what heaven will be like here on earth. So I'm gonna to go to John 17, verse 15. I'm gonna to go to verse 15 first, and then we're gonna read a few verses. Jesus is talking to his heavenly father. Jesus is talking to God. John 17, verse 15, he says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. Jesus' prayer is not God get all of my friends and disciples off of this terrible, sinful world and get them into heaven. What is Jesus' prayer? Protect them from the evil one. Which means that Jesus knew that by being on this earth, the evil one, the devil, will be attacking you. You will experience suffering. You will experience unexpected things that happen in your life. Your life's not going to be perfect. But Jesus' prayer is that you would have the protection and the power and the strength of his heavenly father. Remember, Jesus died at the age of 33 years old. Jesus knew struggle and pain. Jesus understood that while he lived on this earth, things were not gonna go well. So Jesus' prayer is not God evacuate them, but protect them. And to protect someone means you give them strength and you give them power. So now let's start, go back to John 17, and we're just gonna go back a few verses in verse 13. And this is Jesus having a conversation with his father, and this is what's gonna teach us about what it looks like for you today to begin to live into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says, but now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world so that, watch this, that they may have my joy made full in themselves. Jesus' prayer for you is that his joy would be made full in your life. Jesus wants you to be filled with joy. Is that an amen kind of thing to say? Amen. Like, like we, we pass over Bible verses so much because we think that there are certain parts that are more important. But Jesus says, God, I want my joy to be in them. For the person who is single and is looking for their soulmate, God, I want my joy to be in them before they think that that other thing is gonna give them that. For the person that is having a hard time paying the bills, I still want my joy to be complete in them. For the person that is in that toxic work environment, I want my joy to be in them. For the person who's going through that difficult um, uh, marriage, I want my joy to be in them. For the person that has that medical prognosis that looks bleak, oh, God, God, I want my joy to be in them. The kingdom of heaven is about your the joy of Jesus being in your life, and the way you do that is by seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness because the presence of Jesus means you have entered into this new realm of living. So yes, we look to the future for the day when Jesus comes and he takes us to heaven 100%.
but Jesus gives us the promise of his joy today. In this earth, in your life, you can have that joy. And Jesus doesn't stop there. He says, verse 14, I have given them your word. Now the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of this world. Verse 15, I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. Verse 17, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into this world, Father, I also send them into the world. Jesus, he says, God, I want my joy to be in every single one of you. And he says, and I have given them your word and your word is truth. Jesus, the Bible says, is the word. But Jesus also directs us to the words of scripture to remind us that joy comes by being in the presence of Jesus. I want your joy to be complete. God, I am sending them into the world. Jesus says, by by the fact that Jesus says that he is sending you into the world just as God sent Jesus, God sends Jesus into the world for a purpose, for a reason, and Jesus has a reason and a purpose for your life. And first and foremost is a relationship with him, but secondly is about how do you live heaven in your home, in your work, in your marriage, with your friendships. You are a citizen, an ambassador of heaven. And so just to show you a little bit more what this looks like as, I, as we come to a close here in a few minutes, there's a passage, there's a story in Luke chapter 24. Now Luke chapter 24 is the end of the story. It's the last part of the gospel. In Luke 24, Jesus has already been crucified. Jesus has died. He has been put in the tomb. And in Luke 24, the Bible tells us that that Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, went to the tomb to try to help the body of Jesus as they normally would. But the body of Jesus was gone. And they didn't know what that meant. And the angel told them what it meant, but they still couldn't fathom it because, because, because people don't come back to life after they've died. And so they go and they tell the disciples. And and so then this next part of the story in Luke 24 has two two followers of Jesus. It only names one of them as Cleopas. And the other one was just either a follower or a disciple. And the Bible tells us that these two men were walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus, what we call the Emmaus Road. And from Jerusalem to Emmaus was seven miles. Now, anytime the Bible says seven miles, That seven is a symbol of the perfect will of God. Seven is the number of God. God creates the world, and on the seventh day, he rests. So whenever you read the number seven in the Bible, make sure that you open up your eyes because we're about to see something special. So these two followers of Jesus are walking to Emmaus, seven miles. We probably do 20-minute miles when we're walking. So there's a little over two hours worth of time, and these disciples, they were sad. They were depressed. They were grief-stricken the one that they believed was the Messiah, the Savior who would redeem Israel, he was now dead. And not only that, his body was missing. The Bible tells us that Jesus walks alongside them, but they don't know it's him. They don't, Jesus doesn't allow them to recognize him. And Jesus says to these two men, why are you guys so down? What, what, what's bothering you? Why are you so depressed? Why are you heartbroken? And they said, are you the only man in all of Jerusalem that doesn't know what just happened? The one that we thought would redeem us, he is now dead. And the Bible tells us that Jesus, starting with Moses, back in the book of Exodus, all the way throughout the entire Old Testament, Jesus opens up the word to them and explains to them the prophecies and what was supposed to happen. And the Bible says that he tells them this, and they finally get to the place where all the other disciples were, and Jesus pretends like he was going to walk and keep going to the next town, but they invite him in. They say, no, Jesus, or hey, stranger, we want you to come in and have a meal with us. So they go into this room. They're sitting around a table, right? We get images of the Last Supper. They're reclining around a table. Jesus takes the bread, he blesses it, he breaks it, and then he starts handing it out. And in that moment, everyone in that room realizes that it was Jesus all along. And then he vanishes. This is, this is kind of the way the genre of this writing was written. He vanishes, he shows up, and then he's gone. And what these men say, 
Were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? Were not our hearts burning within us? Because whenever you come to the word, you're not just reading words on a page or on your iPad or on your phone. When you are reading the words of scripture, you are giving seed to the Holy Spirit to plant something in you. You are giving the Holy Spirit something to implant into your heart, into your mind, into your, into your consciousness so that the Holy Spirit can grow something new within your life. So these two men said, we're not our hearts burning within us. That's because Jesus was there. It wasn't just the words. It was because Jesus was there with them and they understood that something special was happening. Jesus equals the kingdom of heaven in this earth. So anytime you seek his presence, you're experiencing the kingdom of God. Jesus sends you into this world as his ambassadors this world is not just for your next paycheck. This world, your life, isn't just about getting into the school of your choice. Your life isn't just about the sports that you're into or your extracurriculars or your husband or your wife. This world is not about you. Your life is about more. Your life is about being a representative of the kingdom of heaven everywhere that you go. Like We're going to be looking for the next month and a half the stories in scripture of what Jesus calls you to. And here's my hope and my prayer. I hope that for this sermon series, by the time we get to the end of it, you will be disrupted, that your life will be disrupted, that you will be challenged. I hope at the end of this series that you will make changes in your life, not just the safe changes, but the bigger ones that God calls you to. I'm gonna try to go as hard as I can. And so if you have to be upset about something, you can email me or call me or we can set up a time. But I, I wanna do my best to preach the words of Jesus in a way that are gonna pierce your soul. Because we, we, we don't wanna just make you feel better today. We, we, we wanna challenge you because we believe that living a true life of faith requires more. And it requires the presence and the power of God. And I don't want you to miss out on the life that God is calling you to live. I don't want you to live for too little. I don't want you to live for the things of this world. That's, a, that's a, a poverty of ambition. I want you to live for the heavenly things, for the things that matter most, for the things you were created for and put on this earth to live your life on. I want you to live the God gospel-centered life. Let us pray. Gracious God, you are a God who gives without measure and blesses us in ways that we don't deserve. My prayer for my friends and my family who are here, God, is that you would use the words over this next several weeks or months or however long we go until you tell us to stop. That you would use this to really challenge every person here. God, disrupt us from myself to the last person that leaves this building. Disrupt us and challenge us we don't want to miss out on what you've created for us. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.